genetics of it. There's been millions and millions and millions of pounds spent on unraveling the genetics. Apparently, if you've got Mac in your name and you live in America, you've got or North America, you've got 30 times more chance of developing MS. So they, that, that was a gift from Scotland. And uh, if we've got, if you've got a first degree relative, you're 40 times greater. So one of the big factors in Scotland, though, is the fact that it's such a dreary and dreary place that we don't get much in the way of sunshine. And it's great to come here to Los Angeles. And actually, if it was if it was raining and cold and wet here, I was going to ask for a refund on my airfare. I thought I got to go. And everybody says, you know, my wife texts me and said, "We're flooded. The back garden's flooded." And I said, "It's sunny in LA." <laughs> so, in my supportive away from home kind of husband type thing. So. The low vitamin D, because of the low sunlight exposure, is a big thing. And sometimes this is called the Scottish disease. So, you know, it is something that makes naturally that, you know, you'd expect us to be interested in. So, four years ago was the first time I prescribed LDN. When a patient came in, I think Skip said, you know, what you have to do is go and be really obnoxious to your doctor. So, her and her husband came in, uh, and she was in a wheelchair. And, you know, the thing that struck me, at that point, I had been her GP for 15 years, and she'd never actually asked me for anything. And she came in with her husband and, you know, and said, could I get LDN? And I said, what is that? No idea, never heard of it. Uh, but I didn't feel I could just say an outright no. I thought, I need to look into it a wee bit more and try and find out what this is. And she told me it was naltrexone. Now, I've got a lot of addiction experience. And naltrexone's a horrible drug that hardly anybody takes. I mean, something like 5% or 4% were still on naltrexone in one of the studies after six months. It, because it blocks your endorphins. And your endorphins are wonderful things that make you feel good. And so nobody likes it. And it blocks all the heroin. Uh, so I said, no, tricks one. I wouldn't give that to my dog. Because I, I love my dog. I've, not, I've got two dogs, actually. I love them both. And I don't want to punish them by giving them no tricks one. So, you know, I, I started with this very, very negative view about what possible good this could do this woman. But I did feel just that wee bit of guilt that I've never, she never asked me for anything. Here she is asking me for something. I should look into it. I did look into it. I spoke to Bob Lawrence. I spoke to Linda Elsevier. And I looked in the internet. I looked at the David's website. And I thought, you know, this is quite interesting. Although there's not much. At that point, there was nothing really to support it except, you know, you take the leap of faith sometimes and just say, I'm just going to try it. What harm can it possibly do? So we started on three milligrams. And... At that point, because she was in a wheelchair, it was very difficult to do much of an assessment. So all we did was look at the tremor of her right hand. She had a gross tremor. I got her to pick up something, and it was shaking all over the place. And she came back a month later, and I said, how are you? I was really interested, obviously. First patient I'd put on it. And she said, it's fine. <laughs> no, nothing. And her husband goes, it's great. It's fantastic. He was like a cheerleader at the back with the pom-poms going, it's fantastic. It's working. And I said, pick up that. Uh, and she just went, Phew. and I thought, wow, something has happened. No idea what it is, but something's happened. Uh, so that, fortunately, that was a positive experience. I may never have had a second patient uh, with LDN. So at that point, I, I was, I've had, I always had a, a long, long interest in nutritional medicine, and I was about to open a clinic. This is what I wanted to do, was to open a private clinic where people could get nutritional medicine. And uh, uh, so we were just at the same time as LDN came along. So I thought, you know, I really need to do this and have a look at it. But we were looking at uh, omega-3 particularly, and we checked bloods for omega-3 levels and do this on almost everybody that comes. Uh, we check vitamin D. These are, these are two of the big kind of tests that we will do for any patient, but particularly for MS patients. So we do all this anyway. This is part of the workup. So we use antioxidants. And in addition to that, we started prescribing LDN. And that approach, the nutritional medicine approach, is very, very good for MS. And I would recommend anybody that's got MS to, to, to look at that. Because if you've got a low vitamin D level or you've got a low omega-3 level, you're pushing that, you know, you're pushing against the resistance. You're not, you're not, it's not a level playing field to allow it. And I always say to the patients, because like, someone come very focused, I want LDN. I say, that's great. But we need to look at these other things as well. We need to set a baseline and make sure that there's a, a reasonable foundation in which to build. Jackie, do you want to ask? Oh, yeah, but we're in Scotland, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it, we, we seldom see the sun. So uh, almost all of them are low. You get the odd one, maybe 1 in 10, 1 in 20, that's just high for some bizarre reason. I don't know why. But we we'll always like to check the numbers. And we can do it in the clinic, or GPs can now do it. Uh, so we send people back to their GP with a letter saying, would you check the vitamin D? And sometimes, sometimes we get outrageous, how dare you ask us to do this kind of things. But we just do it anyway because we feel uh, it saves the patient money if they get it done in the NHS. But we found very low levels in most patients. And we aim for 100 to 150 as being the kind of range that we're going for. I'm going to say more about that, actually. 
And there was this study, because, you know, it, it, it suddenly when the LDN came along and the MS patients I was seeing more of them, it suddenly clicked in my head that actually all this nutritional medicine applied to them more than it applied to most people. It was more important for MS patients to make sure that they didn't have deficiencies. And there was this study from Norway, which was on uh, Omega-3, where they looked at, there was only 16 patients, they were newly diagnosed, but they looked at the ratio of arachnidonic acid to EPA, and that's Omega-6 to Omega-3 ratio. So if anybody knows anything about, about Omegas, the essential fatty acids, that's the ratio that seems to be important. And you want that ratio to be as low, not too low, you want it to be about between 1.5 and 3 is the ideal ratio. And in this study it was 6. And I have to say in Scotland the average is 16. So the ratio is worse in Scotland than it is in Norway. Uh, but in that Norwegian study the average was 6. When they were supplementing with omega-3 and encouraged to eat fish to increase their omega levels, they got the ratio down to 1.5. And that produced a 25% improvement in symptoms uh, using the EDSS, which is the Expanded Disability Status Scale, which is a standardized scale for most studies. Now, 25% improvement is fantastic for something with no side effects and, you know, easy to take. You can buy it over the counter. You do need, you do need the right dose to get that kind of re reduction. And sometimes we are starting with people with a ratio of 40, not a ratio of 6. So you sometimes need whacking big doses. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a, another issue. We aim to get it down to there, and we see improvements just with that. With, you know, we, people feel better. It's a b big improvement in mood. There are a lot of studies to now show omega-3 actually is as good as Prozac. And most people that are on the SSRIs and Prozac, I, I try and take them off by putting them on omega-3 for a month and then reducing their dose. And it works. It works very well. So that kind of thing has piqued my interest. Vitamin D, as I say, we're finding it low, and as I'm sure lots of you know, the further away from the equator you go, the more common a lot of diseases are. In fact, sometimes I think we should just all move to the equator, because it seems to be a bit crowded, but, you know, there's so much less heart disease, cancer, MS. So the vitamin D seems to be a big factor in this. And we produced, one of the things I noticed in the clinic was lots and lots of patients were coming in literally with a shopping bag full of the supplements they were taking, and they would line them up, and one lady had 14 different bottles that she was taking. And I thought, God, it'd be an awful lot cheaper and easier if we combined that into one capsule. And we did, but it turned out to be two. But we put five times the recommended daily amount of vitamin D into the capsule because when we more, the more I read about it, it took a year to get all the data together to formulate this capsule. Uh, we ended up putting 2,000 international units. And that's not enough for a lot of people. A lot of people, once you've checked their blood, once they've been on it, they still need to take a bit more. So vitamin D is important. Just another couple of things. One of the studies, big American study that came out last year, February last year, this was published, it looked at 7 million people that were in the forces and followed them up to see which, who had developed MS and looked back at the samples that they'd stored at their initial medical and found that if the level of vitamin D was above 100 nanomoles per litre, there was a 63% reduction in, in development of MS, which is pretty bloody convincing, you know. And a lot of folks still say, oh, there's no research to support it. You know, sometimes your common sense kicks in and think, well, I think that's quite important. There was another study, the Harvard Nurses Health Study, 85,000 nurses followed up for uh, 20 years. If they were taking a vitamin D supplement, there was a 40% reduction in MS. And that was probably a very low dose, 400 international units supplement. In Australia, there's a 73% difference between North and South Australia. South Australia being further away from the equator. So Northern Australia, 73% less MS. And there's a very interesting study that if you're a Scot, and you emigrate to Australia before age 15, <laughs> you've got to get in there before age 15 apparently, uh, the there's a 73% reduction in MS development there. So to me, this is telling us, you know, there's something very important nutritionally going on with this disease that we need to deal with. So that's the kind of background to the, we, the stuff we were working on that we then, uh, LDN was added into that. And, you know, my, my first instinct when I looked at the stuff, I thought, we need to do a trial on LDN. And I'm a GP and I'm busy, but I've done a bit of research in the past and, uh, you know, we had the, the opportunity. We've now been prescribing it for four years, but we started working on the trial four years ago. We almost immediately started thinking we're going to have to try and get a trial here. Now, when Jackie was speaking, I completely sympathise with how bloody difficult it is to do a trial. And you can see why they're only done by big institutions, big organisations that have got lots of money because otherwise, you know, it does. It'll take us probably five, six years. Mm -hmm.